long day, but a good day. And I'm prayerful that it has been a good day for everybody else. So we are absolutely grateful for being able to come together for another time of study in God's word. And as has been said um, in the last number of weeks since we've been going through the gospel of John, this has just been a, a marvelous, very packed study. And I, I'm certain we haven't really unpacked all that we could have unpacked uh, in the time that we were in. But this week, uh, and next week, actually, we're going to be covering the latter part of chapter 10 of John. And it's one of those, even though it's about 20 verses, even though we could cover it tonight, there's so much in it to where I thought that it would be valuable to spend a couple weeks on it. Uh, we'll read through it uh, after we pray for our time together, and then we'll really jump into it. So let's pray for our time together. Our Father, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory for being able to be able to grasp of the wonders of your word, which really speak to the essence of your mind, your thoughts, your heart, and that they can even be toward us. What a wonderful reality to regard. And so thank you for the very essence of hope that we're able to have. Thank you for the growth that we can experience and even the empowerment that we can have for everyday life. We honor you. We praise you. We give you thanks and we glorify you. As we often ask our Father, we pray that you would bless us with a hearing and a believing and a receiving of your word so that we can do. So bless our hearing, bless our believing, bless our receiving, bless our doing, and even tonight, bless our delivering to the praise of your glory. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. So We started the first chapter, the first portion of chapter 10 last week, where Jesus was really dealing with the perspective of him being the door and him being the good shepherd. And we saw in that passage a distinction between those who love those who hate, those who care, and those who don't. More so, we saw the distinction of those who seek to steal, kill, and to destroy versus Christ Jesus as the good shepherd and those who follow him to actually give life and life abundantly. And then we come to a unique and interesting portion of Jesus's life and experience, more so his ministry, to be very honest, that is really going to show how much all of the things that have been happening up to this point have intensified. Um, one of the things I think is important to communicate is that at this point, after this circumstance, this reality that we're going to be covering for the next couple weeks, after this moment takes place, literally, it is about three months that actually is then going to pass to where Jesus finds himself being crucified, okay? And so this moment right here is where things really are at that peak of intensity to where, <laughs> oh man, it, it's really heated. So let's go through the text. Let's answer our three questions that, that we normally answer. And that is, what does it say? What does it mean? And how must it be applied? So let's look at 
what it says tonight. And we're looking at John, the 10th chapter, the 22nd verse through the 42nd verse. And uh, as normal, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe me. The works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said, I am the son of God. If I am not doing the works of my father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I am in the father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. All right? So, for all you people here, for all you people out in Zoom land, the people who are also in the Facebook Live land, again, thank you for joining us but I want to say you are in for a treat. And our subject and topic focus is plain to see. And one of the reasons that I believe that this is going to really be beneficial for us to focus a couple of weeks on it is because there are some things in the second portion of this text that we read particularly from 31 on down that need a little more time and energy, as well as the things in the first part need a little time and energy. So let's focus on our first portion today, which is pretty much going to be 22 through 30. So let's walk back through this and see what does it mean as well as what, how must we apply this, okay? So I want us to take note of the fact that we've been dealing with a lot of different feasts. We've dealt with the Feast of Boots, which is also the Feast of Tabernacles. And there was a number of the, the Passover type of celebrations that have passed in the context of uh, John's writing. So that there have been months and in some cases, maybe even a year or two within the context of some chapters. And so we come to another time where really this is in the colder part of the year. Matter of fact, this is really kind of around the time of December. And how we know this is because the Feast of Dedication is also what we know to be Hanukkah. Okay, so this time frame was very unique and interesting in that we know that Jesus, from the time that he was speaking in John 10, the first portion, and coming out of the ninth chapter, that a number of days, more so months, had actually passed, okay? Because of the separation of time from the feast 
of tabernacles to now the feast of dedication, okay? And Jesus was in a place where he was kind of not in the main portion of the temple, the colonnade of Solomon, it says, uh, because it was a little bit warmer on that side, okay? And so the Jews, it says, gathered around him. Who are the Jews? Now, we know in some instances in this gospel, the Jews were actually related to people, meaning some of the people of the Jewish nation, more so those who lived in Jerusalem, okay? But in this instance, it goes back to the initial focus that John gave us about Jews, and that is the religious leaders, all right? The religious leaders <laughs> were the problem, okay? They were not only the problem, they were also um, an antagonistic, an, an antagonistic force against Jesus. And we're going to see that uh, here shortly. They come to him and they ask the question, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly, okay? I want to make note here that when we go forward, when we go ahead, and we get to the point where Jesus is actually being uh, tried or is on trial in a um, actually unlawful trial, by the way, we will see that they ask him at that point who he is and he tells them and all that kind of stuff. And that actually kind of, you know, escalates things at that point. But here you notice he doesn't say directly, I am the Christ. First of all, when we go back, we can look at, he said very clearly who he was when, in specific, he declared that he was the light of the world, and he declared that he was the living water. Both of those designations spoke to who the Messiah was, and these leaders knew it, okay? But they had, they had an agenda. And that agenda is what we're going to talk about next week. But you got to know, they are literally doing what they have been doing for some time, which is trying to ensnare Jesus by his words. Ensnare him by his words, okay? So let's look at this and see how this actually shakes out. Jesus answers them and says, I told you, and you do not believe. So what he's basically saying is that he has at some point plainly told them who he is. But they have disregarded it, or as we talked about in a number of our studies back, rejected the reality that has been clearly communicated. But then he goes on and says, the works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. He says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I am the father of one. Now, it, the reason that I want to focus on this this week as it pertains to our topic, plain to see, what we clearly understand is that these Religious leaders are asking question, asking question, asking question. They have been doing it from, from the very beginning since after Nicodemus uh, came to Jesus. That they're asking questions to understand who Jesus is simply because they are not looking at who Jesus is based on what the word of God says. They're looking at Jesus is based on what it is that they perceive in natural perspective. Okay, let me explain. 
Jesus says to them again, they think they're in control, okay? How do I know they think they're in control? It say, he, they say to him again, how long will you keep us in suspense? Okay, there's no suspense here, but they're being playful, if you will, to a degree. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. One of the things I want to be very emphasizing of tonight is the reality of words and the very play on them and how there's a tendency or an ability that we can walk in to manipulate words because of what it is that we want to see or somebody else wants to see. Why do I say that? Well, we've talked about this even in the, the last couple studies where Paul tells us the reality of how we're able to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. These religious leaders are absolutely intent on trying to throw shade on the truth. They're trying to suppress it, even though they cannot uh, depress it completely or really oppress it. They're trying to just cover it up. All right. How long, the question is, will you keep us in suspense? What do you mean keep us in suspense? Why would they ask this question based on what Jesus said they've already seen and they know clearly? They would say this not necessarily for themselves. They would say it because they are trying to manipulate the minds of the people around. Does that make sense? Okay. How do we know this? Jesus goes on and speaks to something he was talking about at the first portion of John 10. He starts to talk about his sheep. He says, my sheep hear my voice. He then says, I know them and they follow me. Is that not plain? Okay, it's very plain. In other words, what he's saying is, those who hear me, those who know me, those who follow me, those who have received life from me, those people, they don't need to be proven anything. Those people do not seek, listen carefully, those people do not seek to prove what it is that they want to be proven. Again, I must say this. These religious leaders were being what we would consider master manipulators. Whereas Jesus, watch this, Jesus was not such. Now, this is the, the interesting twist in what they're saying. They're saying, don't keep us in suspense, right? Tell us plainly. But what are they doing? Okay, let's, let's talk about this real quickly. There was a moment back in, uh, I think it was around chapter 7, chapter 8, where there was this issue related to Jesus in the temple during the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Here's what happens. The people of Jerusalem who lived in Jerusalem, who had been getting word and perspective on a regular basis leading up to the feast to basically be on the lookout for this Jesus. Here it is. Jesus comes in privately to the feast. When he comes in privately, this was after a time that they had basically taken down the guard that had been set up to look for him. Now he's privately showed up and now he's in public preaching and teaching in the synagogue and the religious leaders are not doing anything to him. And a question arises, why is it that they're not coming and taking him because they said that he was not to be preaching and teaching and they were looking for him. Like, why are the religious leaders letting him proclaim? Is there, do they know something we don't know? These are the questions that people were asking. Again, it speaks to the fact that what the religious leaders were doing had nothing to do with whether or not they were with God. It had everything to do with 
the fact that they were trying to manipulate the people because the people was a representation of their authority. Now, listen carefully. You got to see that this is in follow up to Jesus talking about the thief, right? And more so, the thief is associated with the hireling. Let me, let me go back into John, the 10th chapter, and read uh, what it is that is very necessary to be understood as Jesus talks about his sheep. If he's talking about his sheep, he's talking about he, him as a shepherd, right? Okay. Listen carefully. Let me start with uh, John 10 and 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd. Listen carefully. It doesn't say not the shepherd. It says not a shepherd. Lays, I'm sorry, not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. He goes on again and says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me. So really, when it comes down to it, Jesus only is repeating what he said. And we talked about this last week because in the, the first portion of John 10, Jesus did a lot of repeating. One, he said, truly, truly. That's, that's an emphasis of attentiveness that he wants to give to what he's talking about. Then he spoke of being the door more than once. He spoke of being the good shepherd more than once. And he even made sure to emphasize that there was the I am the door. I am the good shepherd, okay? And then we'll see this later on when we get to the time where he's on trial, unlawful trial, by the way, that he speaks clearly about him being I am more than once as well. Jesus was very intent on repeating himself to make sure that his perspective was clear. Therefore, these religious leaders are showing that they were actually playing a game. Why? He was clear. Not only was he clear, he repeated himself over and over again. Well, what we are seeing here in the the back and forth between Jesus and these religious leaders, especially following up to what he has talked about and what I just read about the good shepherd and a hired hand, the good shepherd and a hireling, if you will, is that he is making it clear that there are some who are for him because he knows them and they know him. And then there are some that are not for him, but also that are not even for these people. Here it is. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to drive this point home tonight because it is plain to see. Here it is. These religious leaders are back and forth playing with words, not because they are genuine in their faith toward God, not because they absolutely desire to be committed to God, not because they have a sensitivity to the truth. They are doing so because they are seeking to manipulate the people, not to care for them, because if they were to care for them, they would literally be making sure that how they handled the communication between Jesus was one where people would have the ability to choose wisely of whether or not he was someone worthy of following. But everything that they said and did was for the purpose of manipulating the minds. Why is this important? Why is this important for us to give consideration to? It is simply because it's very easy for someone, first and foremost, to dress up like the shepherd, for someone to look like the shepherd, for someone to act like they're on the shepherd's team. That's what Jesus just said to them in the, 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 the text prior to. It's very easy for someone, listen carefully, to act as though they have great concern for you but actually not. And here's the beautiful part Jesus tells us. 
Jesus says, first and foremost, and, and, and I want to be very, very uh, intentional in making sure to segue into the part where he talks about his miracles and his provision in just a moment. So when it really comes down to what it is that has been dealt with with these religious leaders, I think it's important to also say this because Jesus talks about his works being something that speak for him. I want to go back to the moment, there's two situations. One, he heals the man who had the withered hand on Sabbath day. He then hears, heals the man who was blind from birth. He does it on a Sabbath day. And they actually want to arrest him. They want to take hold of him because he was violating the Sabbath. <laughs> this is a problem because Jesus says that you are very clear on who I am, but you don't want to accept it. It's not his exact words, but that's what he actually means. Here it is. They want to know, are you the Christ? But the Christ was declared to be the light of the world. The Christ was declared to be the living water. The Christ was declared to uh, actually perform various miracle signs and wonders for the purpose. Listen carefully. For the purpose of them proving that he is from God in heaven. And that's where I really want to segue. And these leaders do not want to acknowledge that. Listen carefully. While it is important that Jesus' works pointed to the fact that God was working through him and proving who he was, is powerful in, it, in and of itself to prove that he is the Christ. But there's another something that I think is very important that we need to make sure we get in our own minds for today. And that is this. The miracles, and we've talked about this before in past studies, the miracles, signs, and wonders that Jesus did are not to be looked at as miracles, signs, and wonders that we ourselves can do and replicate. Listen to me carefully. And I say this because it is becoming increasingly more emphasized by many who are actually wolves in sheep's clothing that we need to focus on the miracle signs and wonders. No. How do I know that? First of all, Jesus said that they didn't believe him. But what is it that they didn't believe? In past chapters, we saw that they didn't believe his word. Hmm, why is that important? Jesus says right here in 27, my sheep hear my voice. I want y'all to hear this and see this. It does not say that my sheep hear my works, does it? It really, it doesn't even say that the sheep care anything about his works. Here's what I'm saying. And this is also from a personal awareness of growing in Christ. As you grow in Christ, as you come to know Christ the more, you come to a place where you do not care at all about necessarily what he does or what you get from him or what you see because who he is is so vast. Listen to me carefully. Does that mean that we don't ask God for anything? Does that mean that we don't ask the Lord Jesus to, to give us anything, to provide us anything? No, it's the same thing with a husband and wife. It doesn't mean because your relationship is so deep that you don't ask each other for anything. It's more so because the relationship is so deep, you don't need things happening to validate or prove the fellowship, the relationship, and the, the unity of that relationship. Huh? 
So when it comes down to it, Jesus right here tells us that the sheep that are his are not like these religious leaders that are always looking for a way to manipulate the situation to fit within the context of what it is that they want to see and desire. Huh? It is that his sheep, Jesus, his sheep are absolutely content with his voice. So much and so that he said prior to a stranger, they will not follow. And they are content with his voice because he gives them life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of his hand. We're going to spend the last bit of our time right here tonight because this is, I think, the most beautiful part of it. As I, as I kind of read over this a number of times uh, today, um, just, you know, kind of refreshing, I really found myself moved by this portion in 28 and 29. He says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. As I read that, there was this, I guess you say, unique awareness or this, this moment of aha, you know, we call that epiphany and things of that, things of that nature. But this here was very powerful because I want us to see this. I think sometimes we forget the fact that we are yet in natural being. And in natural being, we have eternal life. Jesus in the 17th chapter, we're not going to go there right now. Yes, I need to go there. I, I, I don't like jumping ahead because I, I want to try to keep the flow in the field, but I want to jump over here in the first portion of 17 uh, Jesus begins his prayer it says he lifted up his eyes great great to have you there Tanisha look forward to you joining us again next time he says he lifted up his eyes Where is it at? Here we go. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh. Listen carefully. To give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Listen carefully. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Okay. Here, when Jesus says, I give them eternal life, basically what he's saying is, I give them knowledge of the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom God, the Father, has sent, and they will never perish. This piece here is most beautiful because it speaks to a re-emergence of, it speaks to a re-emergence of that which existed in the very beginning. What do, what do you mean, Brother Leo? It speaks to the re-emergence of that communion and fellowship with God that Adam and Eve had in the beginning where God would come and be with them in the cool of the day. It speaks to the fact that there is an absolute reinstating of relationship with God. Listen carefully. Well, I want to say this. 
When I say an absolute, look at this. They will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. And my father who has given them is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Basically, there's nothing, nothing that can happen to take those who believe away from Christ Jesus. Away from God. In other words, you will never again experience life without a connection, a link, a fellowship with God. Not just with God as an ideal or this oneness, but God in the fullness of his person, that Jesus is speaking to him as the son or the word, and then the father who is the initiator, the establisher, the ancient of all days, and the spirit of truth. So here it is, these religious leaders have evidence that they are not the sheep of Christ. And evidencing that they are not the sheep of Christ are also communicating that they truly have no fellowship with God. For God is represented as the Father. And now Jesus makes sure it's clear, the Father and the Son. <laughs> and of course, we know the spirit of truth who is the leader and guider into truth. Here's the truth. I like that. <laughs> Here's the truth. What Jesus introduces in this first portion of text is that there's an absolute reality that it is plain to see and know who he is. And plain to see who is really not for him. I think this, it's very important that we look at all the chapters leading up to now and take notice of the fact that Jesus was very masterful in ensuring that there was a distinction of him and all those who follow him and are on the side of truth and therefore with God versus those who are actually not, even though it looks like they can be with God, even though they had positions and roles and authorities and things of that nature. Doesn't matter. Here's the truth. There's no reason, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on record in saying this. There's no reason that any of us should doubt who Jesus is, who Jesus said he is, and who he is to be in our lives. There's no, there's no reason for us to doubt it. There's no reason for us to remain in suspense or to demand that it be plainly communicated to us. Now, I, I think this is important to close tonight's study the portion of focus. What gall for the created to demand of the creator an explanation? <laughs> what foolish thinking for them to see the works that Jesus did and, and even it was interesting because right above here, the people asked this question. These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? <laughs> Nobody had ever done that. I mean, you know, the, the prophets of old had performed very miraculous healings. They did. But none of them ever opened the eyes of the blind. <laughs> none of them. None of them ever, ever gave sight 
to the blind. No one. And then not only to the blind, to someone who was born without being able to see. After seeing that reality that the man was born blind and it was proven that he was born blind. At this point, why are they even asking him any questions? What, what more do, do you need to see? It's plain to see that this is the son of God. This is the one whom God has set his seal upon to be the preeminent and priority one. And we know this because in no way, shape, form, or fashion did the Father separate himself from Christ Jesus. No, no way, shape, form, or fashion. There was no moment, especially among these religious leaders, that Jesus was rejected by the Father and not able to perform that which was consistent with his nature. Everything that he did was consistent with the Father's will. Is it plain to see for you? If it is, I pray that you be granted believing, receiving, doing, so that you may see the true benefit of it. I usually ask for some time to share, but want to go ahead and move forward tonight and go straight into our time of prayer to close out. Our Father, we thank you that you in Christ Jesus are one. Thank you that your word is enough and that it is plain enough for us to see who you are who Christ is, who the Holy Spirit is, to see the unity that exists between you and even the unity that you have granted us to experience with you through Christ. Help us live in the context of the plainness of sight, of the truth, and not live in a suppression of the truth. Also that we might be influences of life to others and not manipulators of life who seek to destroy, to steal and to kill, who seek to abandon people in their weakest moments and times. Bless us and keep us is our prayer. In the glorious name of Christ Jesus, we pray. And we say, thank God. Amen. Guess what you need to do? Be blessed to be a blessing. Don't take care tonight.